Hello, hello and welcome to the Digital Times, the Melbourne International Jazz Festival's online program. On behalf of our panel, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the lands of the traditional owners uh, of the Kulin Nations and we pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. This roundtable discussion is a conversation on leadership and professional pathways in improvised music. I'm Martel Olerinshaw and I was invited by the Art Orchestra to facilitate the discussion. I work as a creative producer and have a background in artist management, specifically for musicians working in jazz and improvised music. I also devise and produce talent development and leadership programs for creative jazz and improvising musicians. And I started doing this work in the UK in 2004 with a program called Take Five that has been running annually since then and has had several spin-offs for other genres in other countries. I love doing this work and last year devised a multinational program called Sound Out. That is for creative musicians who defy, defy categorization and one of whom is with us today. That's Aviva Indeen. Hello, Aviva. Hello. Thanks for having me. Hello. Um, with this roundtable discussion, we're specifically talking about some current leadership programs in Australia. And Aviva has been a bit of a pioneer, having been the inaugural Pathfinder on the Australian Art Orchestra's Pathfinder program. She's joined by two other emerging artists, fellow Pathfinder Ruben Lewis. Hello, Ruben. Hi, Mattel. And Claire Cross, who is currently the associate producer of Take Note. Um, we've just heard from Holly Moore, who's participating in that program now. Um, but you were the um, inaugural participant of its predecessor. Now it's my turn. And these programs are part of the development offer from the Melbourne International Jazz Festival. Hello, Claire. Hi, thanks for having us. Um, we're also joined by Peter Knight, the Artistic Director of the Art Orchestra, and Hadley Agreds, the CEO of Melbourne International Jazz Festival. With today's discussion, we're interested in exploring how emerging improvising musicians build sustainable careers in Australia's unique arts and culture sector, what opportunities are available to them, and what skills they need to succeed. So we'll start with the organisations, with Peter and Hadley, telling us more about their respective programs. Peter, hi. I'm assuming hi, that you don't, need, you don't need much of an introduction in your hometown, and certainly not from me, because we've known each yeah. other a long time. Um, but it'd be great if you could tell our audience quickly about yourself and why you set up the Pathfinders program. Yeah, thanks a lot, Martel, and thanks, Hadley, and the Melbourne Jazz Festival for hosting this discussion. It's really important that these discussions happen, I think. Um, I, I got the job um, as Artistic Director of the Art Orchestra in 2013 and I'd always been um, an independent artist and, um, and I took over from the wonderful Paul Grabowski, um, big shoes to fill, um, and, and it was a, a really steep learning curve for me. Um, and when I got the job, I don't think I had any idea, in fact, I'm absolutely sure, I had no idea of the things that I had to learn in order to be able to uh, do the job of artistic director. And there's a whole lot of stuff around, uh, you know, things that aren't obvious, like governance and, um, and how, you, how boards work and what the role of the producer is and how that relates to the artistic director. And um, so there's all of these, you know, kind of really practical organisational skills that are really important for, for running an organisation like, like the Art Orchestra. Um, and for um, other jobs like being a festival director, you know, Job Hadley's got, um, and uh, and I, I think there's there's not many opportunities for musicians, particularly in improvising uh, music and jazz music circles. Um, there's not very many opportunities to learn those skills, and um, and that had been on my mind for a while since I got the job as. Uh, as artistic director and um, and through the course of um, running our creative music intensive and through conversations with lots of young musicians and uh, as part of that um, decided to try to create a program an artistic associate program that would um, would enable musicians to have really high level artistic experiences um, in the context of the Australian Art Orchestra and the cross-cultural, particularly the cross-cultural work that, that we make, but also um, that uh, who could be embedded in the organisation and learn some of those skills that are so important and that are less obvious for um, leaders in, in music. So that's how it happened. Um, it wouldn't have happened without the incredibly generous support of the Ian Potter Foundation, which, uh, which funds this program. 
And we also have additional uh, support from Creative Victoria and Australia Council for the Arts. So I'd like to acknowledge um, that support and um, particularly the Ian Potter Foundation who had the vision to see that this was necessary and that this was um, a, a real gap that needed to be filled. And I can answer some more questions right at the end, but I'd like to pass over um, uh, to Hadley and, and um, yeah, thank you. Great. Um, so support's important. We'll, we'll keep that um, um, for later on. Uh, Hadley, hello. Lovely to meet you. Hello. Likewise. Um, again, I'm assuming that you don't need much introduction, um, introduction particularly since it's your own event. Um, but for those <laughs> of us in the audience who have just joined, um, could you tell us quickly about yourself and your role at the Melbourne International Jazz Festival, please? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, so yeah, the, the, currently the CEO of the festival and I took over this role in probably February last year from uh, Jennifer Kerr, who'd been with the organisation for the better part of a decade. So um, again, uh, big shoes to fill. It's been a great ride so far, although I must say this year has been um, a roller coaster of a ride. And mm -hmm. prior to that, I was the uh, program director as well. So it was a nice transition, I guess, if you will, um, from from sort of a more purely programming um, position and, and producing role, I think, into sort of a more, you know, a larger role holistic. that encompasses more holistic. holistic. That's the one. Thanks, Martel. Um, so, yeah, it's been, um, it's been a great experience, although I must say I've only been with the festival since early 2018, um, which uh, was timely for, for this particular program that we're talking about um, from the Jazz Festival's point of view, the Take Note program, uh, because that was conceived um, at that time. Um, and a lot of credit must go to my predecessors, Jen, and also Dean Worthington, who's our former marketing and development uh, director, who was also instrumental in kind of conceiving a pro this program, which they, th it's quite a sort of a multifaceted program. And as you said, Martel, I hope everyone gets a chance to go and watch Holly's performance uh, that just finished um, here at the studio if you haven't already. Uh, but yeah, so Holly's performance is the premiere of a new work and that's one facet of this um, program, which is, I guess, focused simultaneously on artist development, but also it's a gender equity program because I'm sure we'd all acknowledge that there's a pretty serious problem um, that continues to exist um, in contemporary music and, and I feel especially in jazz. So uh, this program is... Um, one way we found we could contribute to addressing some of the concerns that, that exist in the sector around gender equity, but also um, approach artist development from that perspective as well. Uh, so well, just very briefly, the program has this performance outcome that, that Holly's just um, done for us, but also a large educational component because um, we've identified over the time that mid to late high school is a crucial point in uh, students, particularly female students, dropping out of jazz courses at schools. So Holly will be either going into schools or doing digital workshops with a lot of students aiming to kind of workshop and role model for the next generation to hopefully um, have something to aspire to. Thanks. Can I just ask a question around that? Because um, uh, do you bring, uh, do you bring uh, Holly's work back into the festival as well? Is it upheld as part of the festival? Um, in a broader sense, or is it an outreach program? Uh, Holly's work is in the um, the performance element and the composition. The, no, the work with the, with the um, schools. Yeah, absolutely. In a typical year, we certainly um, do. So I'll let I'll definitely let Claire speak more to that um, because she was the the pilot participant, I suppose, in our first year last year. But um, you know, in a normal year, there would have been a student outcome as well uh, with some select students from the workshops that Holly would have conducted face to face uh, as a nice sort of uh, performance outcome. And again, a kind of aspirational moment for those high school students, particularly those yeah. that are showing yeah. a lot of promise. Yeah, and in, an important um, role for the festival to play, to be the presenter of young talent like that too. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, so now we've got uh, part two, the artists. Um, Claire, if you could just pick up with, uh, from what Hadley said, it's great um, that you could be with us today and it's wonderful to see the work that you're doing um, uh, with Take Note, which addresses underrepresentation of women and gender minorities in jazz. Um, you're a composer and a bassist, uh, not the stereotypical um, instrumental choice for a, for a woman in jazz. No. Um, but we do see more of you 
these days, which is great. Um, could you tell us a bit about your career, how you sustain it, and why you've chosen to blaze a trail for the next generation in this way, please? I'm still trying to figure out how I sustain it, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, I guess I am in a position where I'm um, able to have quite a diverse career, which I really enjoy. I like being project focused and I like doing lots of different things. So um, whether it's the time when I'm writing my own music and performing or performing and learning other people's music as a sort of session player um, or, you know, working for someone like Melbourne International Jazz Festival, um, I, I like to be really project focused and I guess that's something that actually does nourish and sustain me as an individual. I, I'm a very restless person. So um, if I do one thing for too long, I start to get a bit itchy. So I guess that's always been a big thing for me that drives me is um, challenging myself and then moving on to the next thing, which is also then going to challenge me that I can learn from and um, keep focusing in that way. Um Sorry, and what was the second half of the question? The second half of the question was, um, so you sustain it by having a portfolio. Um, why you've chosen to bla blaze a trail for the next generation was the second part of the question. I don't know if it was a choice. <laughs> it kind of, um, it just kind of turned out this way. Um, again, I guess, uh, you know, you can be project focused when it comes to wanting to make a difference to the world. So, um, you know, starting up a program that I run called Yowo Music, for instance, which is a very similar idea to Take Note, except it doesn't necessarily involve jazz. It's more contemporary pop music for high school aged um, girls and gender diverse teenagers. That's very much like a project focus organisation, I guess. Um, and it's just that, that, that moment, I guess, where you go, um, something's wrong let's just do something. <laughs> let's, let's just fix it. <laughs> um, very practical, you know, rather than sitting around and, and talking about the problem for a long time, I like to get stuff done, I guess. So, um, you know, that's how that, that program started up five years ago. And I'm pretty sure probably Take Note ended up being a similar thing where people just went, we've just got to do this. Let's get it done. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I guess I hope that answers that question. But I like, I like the belief. Well, I, I, if, if it's your belief, I'm sure it's your belief and it's probably the festival's belief too. If you can see it, you can be it. I really like that. It sounds fantastic. Um, it's a great thing to, to um, a nice little catchphrase, you know, for people to, you know, catch, latch onto really easily and to move ahead with that. So do you, how, how many, is, is it thriving, this Take Note um, program and, and all the young women and all the gender minor, young gender minorities who are out and about doing stuff? Do we think we're going to have a resurgence of, this is going to be a big thing in jazz from now on? I would hope so. Um, I know that my experience of it last year, when I got to go out to schools and meet with students and work with them, that, um, you know, there is a difference between, there can be a gender difference between how, you know, the young boys and the young women are um, engaging with trying to improvise, for instance. And I guess, um, you know, as someone who had to sort of really punch through the wall to stay in this genre and get into it in the first place, um, you know, I didn't have too many role models. And I think for young women, you know, seeing someone who looks like them do what they need to do, that's incredibly powerful. Um, and I think I, in hindsight, would have really benefited from having some of those people around when I was um, up and coming and younger. Um, and so, you know, we've had a lot of really good response to the Take Note online workshop series so far. We've had a, I don't know if I'm allowed to say the number. <laughs> you know, we've had 27 schools across Victoria sign up, which has been a fabulous response. Um, and, you know, I guess from a personal perspective as the associate producer of that program, I, a big focus for me is building those relationships and making the jazz festival and this art form part of it, their community. So not just being this thing that kind of dives in and out of people's lives um, and, you know, building something meaningful and long lasting in that respect. And so I think if we're working with a long vision of, of building those relationships, then I would like to think that, um, you know, that we'll see some difference being made. Great. Thanks. Ruben? Ruben, hi. Hi. <laughs> hi. What a year to be a Pathfinder, Ruben. 
Uh, so um, we'll come to Aviva after you, but she's, she's paved the way for the first year. She was the inaugural uh, participant in this new program. Mm. Um, um, but I'm sure what Aviva did uh, um, uh, couldn't have really, because of, because of COVID, really couldn't have um, paved the way so much for what you, or could have, you couldn't have predicted what, what would have happened for you since we're in the middle of this pandemic and confined to quarters and wearing... Uh, Wearing face masks. Wearing Very fashionable face masks. masks on your path, yes. Yes. Um, uh, can, you, can you tell us a bit about what attracted you to, uh, you to Pathfinders, please, and whether it's lived up to your expectations? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, I guess um, the, uh, the interest in the Pathfinder program um, started well before the Pathfinder program was a thing. Um, I was a um, participant in the Australian Art Orchestra's creative music intensive, um, not once, but not twice, but three times, I think. I was uh, there for the first time in Tasmania and Taralea, the second time as well. And um, I guess when that program came up, it was at a time in my life where I was um, really making a strong decision to invest in new experiences and putting myself in positions where I would meet new people, make new music, make new art with different uh, practitioners from dancers to theatre workers to visual artists to all sorts of things. And um, I guess um, the time in Taralia um, with the Art Orchestra and various cohorts um, really gave me a chance to broaden my horizons as far as what, what could be possible and see um, inspiring artists from all backgrounds and all sort of uh, interests uh, coming together and doing good stuff. And I guess one of the sort of uh, things that came from that period was I realized that I didn't quite know what to do or how to get involved in that, in that time. And um, Peter and the crew at Taralia were able to sort of uh, open themselves up and give, give me a, a chance to ask those questions. So I've had many a late night walk with, um, with Peter through the snow mm -hmm. saying, I've got this thing in mind. I want to do this project. How do I do it? And I think uh, that was where it started. So I guess when the Pathfinder program was announced, I looked at it and thought that's, that's exactly it. I don't, don't exactly know what I'm going to learn, but I feel like this is the environment where I will have a chance to actually uh, ask those questions, but also more importantly, be in a situation where I have to learn the answers. Um, and I guess that's the uniqueness about this program um, in that it is a, a bit of a back and forth relationship in the sense of you are, you're not just there to be a, um, you know, a fly on the wall or to learn something. You're there to actually be part of the team and to help them produce their projects and develop new ideas and really sort of sit there and, and, be an active member of what they're putting together for a 12 month period. And I guess thinking about what I imagine Aviva's experience would be compared to mine, um, even without the, you know, the onset of COVID, I think both of our experiences would be entirely different because we're different people with different skill sets and different aspirations and different stages, I guess, perhaps in our careers or, our, or different uh, long-term goals. And the, time with Peter and Jerry and Jim um, and the various projects over this 12 months has been a chance for me to um, continue on that path and perhaps um, also gain some pretty crucial perspectives on how those things work. So it's, um, so it's uh, for you, it's a continuation of a, um, uh, of a set of opportunities and quite significant mentoring from Peter, I should um, I hasten to add, it seems that you've got a, yeah. a lovely relationship with him and it's a nice, easy, um, uh, well, it's, 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 it's possible for you to discuss all of your aspirations and, and, and also really get right down into granular detail about um, what you're doing really with, with Peter because he's got much more experience than you in that regard. And so therefore it's been a nice seamless transition into Pathfinders, which is a more active and it's a quite a learning scenario too isn't it because you're in the deep end with the organization you're involved in the marketing jerry told me that you're um you're quite a whiz with the, uh, the video one of the many skills i managed to pick up in this uh especially in this isolated time um Useful, what, yeah. <laughs> thank you i mean i guess so uh, i guess Peter was, was um, you know, by his nature, he's a wonderful way in for many um, emerging artists in Australia because he does have the nature of being very open and supportive, but also, you know, uh, 
critical and gluey enough to see where we could sort of use a nudge to go in the right direction. But I would hasten to add that um, my time spent at the Art Orchestra has been um, just as much working closely with Jerry Remkes, who's executive producer, but also Jem Savage, who is the um, associate producer of the group. We, we all work in the office together virtually and physically when we could. And um, it's, a, it's a chance for me to also see what the nature of those roles are and what those people are doing to put together something quite ambitious on a regular basis. And can, and I, would can, help. I, butt in, can I butt in for one second? Of course, um, Peter. I, I, I would also say that, um, that for me, it's been a real learning experience. Like being around Aviva and being around Ruben, I think it's definitely a two-way kind of thing because I feel like I'm getting so much in the way of inspiration and ideas from um, younger musicians who are, um, you know, super switched on, got super high level skills. And so, and I think that that, that kind of um, resonates right through the group, you know, I, like I feel like everybody has, has benefited so much from um, their involvement. And, um, and I, I'd say also like, um, you know, Ruben uh, was with us earlier this year when we went to Canada and worked with Nicole Lise. And I think that you know, those kinds of relationships too are really, really important. Mm. And, um, and uh, that, I think that was also a really great two way kind of um, process of, of learning and, and development. Um, so um, the success of this program Pathfinders, and I do think it's been really successful, um, has also been because we've, we've had two absolutely phenomenal um, young artists, creative people, mm. Um, so I, you know, I want to thank Aviva and Ruben for all of their energy and ideas and, you know, everything they've brought to it. Which perfectly gets me onto the next, next thing, um, is the fact that one of the, um, one of the provo provocations here was about the unique, um, uh, unique situation in Australia. And um, as you know, I, I um, am Australian, but looking at you because I don't actually live where you live. Um, <clears throat> And it is a unique situation, you know, I can see it and I'm reminded of it every time I, um, well, practically every day, you know, because I work with Australians constantly, but every time I come home, I'm really reminded of it. And particularly, I mean, you're really lucky in Melbourne, Victoria, Melbourne and Victoria. I mean, it's a fantastic place to live and make work. And what I find really interesting is the, um, the nature of the cross-cultural collaboration that um, Ruben alluded to earlier, and which is what we know well, what I know of Aviva, particularly, I know, I know that she's um, working across all sorts of, sorts of genres. Um, and I know that she's been, um, uh, she's been uh, um, a leadership and developmental opportunity on steroids in the last couple of years, I think. <laughs> she's been associated with Chambermaid and with the Art Orchestra. You've been to Banff um, in Canada and um, you participated, as I said earlier, in the Sound Out program that... Um, that the art orchestra was part of and that we uh, we had a residency in Poland. So um, Aviva, the lockdown must be uh, great for you to be at home for a while. Uh, that's a that's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> I got to say I was a bit relieved at first, um, like even though I, mean, I had to actually cancel my first solo tour to Europe, which was a bit heartbreaking. But there was part of me that was like, oh, I don't have to go and sit on a plane. That's actually excellent um drag my bass clarinet around multiple train stations so yeah it was a bit of a relief but um i don't know i'm getting a little bit itchy feet i kind of want to go somewhere yeah. yeah i'm sure i'm sure so um so all of these <laughs> programs all of these programs they're not all about you um not all about you being a um oh well, maybe they are all about you being an improviser but also they're um um improviser in a broad sense um the fact that you can um uh, use those skills uh, in any in any any context, and um, I know that you work a lot in um, other genres or in, in a multi art form in a cross genre um, scenario. So could excuse me because you've got so many of these um, programs. Um, maybe we should just concentrate on Pathfinders and maybe a little bit about Sound Out. But what's be useful for us to know is. Um, uh, what you've what you've picked up from all of these things, what attracts you to doing these these programs, and um, what sort of things you've picked up. Um, well, I would probably just say that the main thing that you pick up is just your relationships and friendships, um, which then become your kind of like professional but also personal networks. Um, so 
something that's so incredible about having taken part in Pathfinders and also Sound Art is just having this kind of like art family, I guess, that you can just call on that is, um, you know, people who are just there who you've developed a relationship with, like you're invested in each other's work. Um, you're always drawn to these things. You know, I wouldn't have applied to the art orchestra's program if I wasn't really interested in their work. And um, same with Chambermaid or any of these other companies. It's like you're attracted to that work and then you sort of want to understand how that comes about, how that comes into being in the world and what are the processes that prop that up and make that possible. Um, and then vice versa, I feel like it's the same. So then those companies are um, led by and work, people work there that are also invested in my work and um, you know I now have a feeling that they also want to see me succeed and want want to see my work develop and so it's kind of like this beautiful reciprocal um, relationship that you have after that time and it's really amazing to be able to call Peter on the phone and say like you know I have this idea I'm thinking about this program this residency if you think it's a good fit and like we'll kind of be able to have those discussions and throw ideas around which um, I feel so fortunate to have um, and I think you know um, in a way that's probably whether or not you have access to these particular programs I think that those kinds of relationships are really important for young artists to have just to be able to like have a sounding board for your ideas. Um, I've really noticed that during this time as well because I think a lot of that happens in set breaks which like at concerts or you know, in the foyer of a theatre show um, where you just see your colleagues and you just talk about what you're thinking about and, you know, you get a sense of whether it's a good idea or not. Um, and I'm, I know that I'm really missing that at the moment. So particularly over the last month or something, I've just been kind of making more of an, an effort to like reach out to those uh, mentors or um, they could also just be colleagues or friends just to have those conversations because I think they're so important to us as artists. Yes, um, I agree. I think that the, the community is a huge aspect, isn't it? And it's not just, um, as, as actually you and Peter have both alluded to, it's, it goes both ways, you know, for, um, for the artist, it's important for the sector to provide opportunity and to provide um, uh, advice, mentoring, help, you know, guidance, um, sometimes to steal your ideas. How, how about that, hmm. yeah, steal an idea? Well, I, I, yeah, like a, a, a couple of thoughts that, that come to mind. Um, I think um, it's super important for organisations that there are, um, there are younger musicians who have got the skills and ideas and um, yeah, knowledge to be able to step into the, these roles, like the one that I'm in that I won't be in forever. But it's a good feeling to know that there's, you know, people building the skills that I didn't have when I started and um, and and that um, you know uh, that people that younger people will form other companies that can do bigger ideas you know that there, sh there should be four or five equivalents of the art orchestra in, in Australia there's only one it's it's um, we need we need more we, we need more um, infrastructure so that artists can realize bigger ideas and that's some um, the other thought that really came to mind is some um, I think there's a thing with musicians. Um, we we get very um, we get very obsessed and focused on skills development in in music, and um, and that's really important. And it's really important to practice and get good at your instrument. But sometimes, you know, we've got our heads down doing that, and um, and when we're we're not as good at looking up and thinking about opportunities and how to how to make opportunities work and how to um, how to create a trajectory that might be going over five years. And, and I think a lot of um, people that I've met um, have fantastic bigger ideas, but they have absolutely no idea of how to make them happen. Um, and, and, you know, the ways, the, the pathways to realising bigger ideas are not always obvious. And uh, so it's really, this kind of exchange, these kinds of conversations um, the community and the network that Aviva's talking about, we need to really build these things and not just through Pathfinders and, um, and the, the programs that the Melbourne Jazz Festival are running, but, um, you know, we need, we need more. We need more opportunities. We need um, more. And, you know, and also sound out, you know, the, the work that you've done, Martel, in, in the UK um, with Take 5 as well, you know, that's a real... Those things can really, we've got a lot to learn from those, those things. And um, 
and I think that the scene will 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 benefit a lot um, if we can if we can follow some of those um, examples. And so you know, yeah. we, we it's great to have you in this discussion because um, I think you can teach us a lot. Well, it's interesting about the, the examples. I think that the, the whole idea of community and constant opportunity and constant discussion about um, this topic, particularly, you know, the, the, the well, what, I don't know what you're calling it in Australia, but here they're calling it the talent development type um, pipeline. I mean, they're really, it's a really important thing. In the you know, UK, and, they're calling it that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a it's a management term, you know, and it comes from it's come sort of corporate thing. But um, mm. but actually, uh, it's useful when you think about it because what we've discussed today, there is a pipeline. Claire's doing work mm. in in schools to try and um, uh, generate interest and uh, sustainability and ambition in young people, and. Um, then we've got, you know, three artists at, 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 you know, at an exciting, you know, time in their career doing, doing their thing and trying to find their feet and, you know, where they're placed and how to be more sustainable and to do interesting things and to meet the, um, build a network. And then, um, you know, we've got uh, you and me and Hadley, you know, we all um, uh, are the next generation and we've been doing all sorts of things and we've tried all sorts of things and we're really interested in, um, what's new and, and how to help the, the next generation. And we want to work hand in glove with them. It's a really important thing, this whole idea of connection um, and constant discussion about what's going on. And just the whole, the energy around so many people. And I think this is why the Melbourne art scene is so fantastic because it's a fantastic scene and it gets even more fantastic as the years go by because it starts from a position of being fantastic. So everyone's sort of not in competition. It's just, it's just that, you know, you see, you, it's a very rich environment. You can see what's going on and, and you're inspired by the people. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. So, um, so uh, where we're at there, what was I going to say then? Uh, infrastructure, infrastructure, just um, both of you, Peter and Hadley, you alluded to it earlier about um, funding, support, um, to do these things. The, I mean, I love this work. I can't tell you how much I love this work, but the only problem with this work is I spend my whole life writing funding applications and reports um, because there's no box office. It's not as like you can put on a show and get a box office. It's basically, um, it's, it's not, the good thing is there's no risk financial risk attached once you've got the once you've got the money in place but it does require a lot of skill and forethought and um, a leap of faith and and trust on, but on behalf of the um, the funders and particularly if you've got um, philanthropic or corporate supporters maybe Hadley you could tell us a bit about that yeah absolutely and, and all the points you make are obviously um, very true in our cases I'm sure they are for, for Peter and the AAO um, the nice thing about it from our point of view and, and the partners we've got and, and these sort of programs, I think, is if you're fortunate enough to get a couple of key ones, um, in our case, we've got the Keston Family Foundation and this year, the Robert Saltzer Foundation. I know Peter mentioned um, the partners of, of Pathfinders as well. And I think uh, I've certainly found with this particular program, having um, a couple come on at a very early stage, there's a really great investment um, in the program itself. And I think it's a genuine, it's one of those moments where it's a genuine partnership, I think. Uh, so we're very fortunate um, with this current program in that regard. And it gives us a lot of space to think of it in, in a longer term or at least the medium term sense to have a little bit of security around that. Um, so that's the good news story, but I think, um, I don't think that necessarily applies in every single case and it certainly doesn't apply to every program that, that we cook up that we think is valuable and worthwhile. It doesn't mean that um, everyone necessarily agrees. Uh, so I suppose the aspiration is, is to find partners who are as engaged or, or feel that there's a, a need or an urgency around a particular program as we have in our case. Um, and that's what we're always looking for. And that's, I find, I suppose, with any project where the best um, partnerships and outcomes come about. Yeah, the good thing, the good thing, looking back from, um, uh, so I don't, you know, I don't, I don't produce Take Five anymore, but I did it for 13 years. And the beauty of, um, the beauty of looking back on it after all that time, um, and for doing it for all that time was that we were able to um, integrate all of those artists into the London Jazz Festival. 
so and other platforms that the um, Sirius or the London Jazz Festival um, uh, have. So they have an, an annual touring program and they have an education department and all sorts of stuff. And so because we had this brilliant young generation of musicians who were going through Take Five, we were able to um, understand their needs, what they wanted to do, what their ambitions were, where their weaknesses were and where they needed help to do certain things. And we were able to provide opportunity um, within that context so that they could actually become the, uh, what I started calling the circulatory system um, of the organisation. And it really sort of gave, the, gave the, the programming a real boost because we were really tapped in uh, with this next generation. There was a lot of energy um, and a lot of new ideas coming from that. So actually, for sponsors and supporters, this is a fantastic thing for them to see. The legacy of it is not, not, it's not quick, but it is enduring and it is really, really exciting. Yeah, and I think one interesting thing I should jump in and say that we've sort of found by chance in terms of our immediate legacy is that Claire's now doing um, very active roles in the organisation um, in an ongoing way that's far beyond the professional development of the program. So. Um, I think with us, we're, we're looking and we're forming these connections with a generation of artists through this program, which is going to be really beneficial in the sense that I think you're talking about um, in London, but in an immediate way, we've had a great organisational impact and it's a beautiful um, sort of natural, organic, I suppose, outcome of last year's program that Claire uh, stepped into, uh, produced the Take Note program and then since then has actually taken on um, a programming role as part of the online festival as well. So. Uh, you never know, I suppose, where these opportunities and what relationships you can form. Um, and once you work with certain people, you, you realise skill sets and connections. And, um, and I mean, I yeah. guess look at Claire now. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and it's also, all, that's all three of the artists. I'm looking at you, sorry, I'm pointing at you as I look at you. All three <laughs> of the artists, it's, it's really interesting. The, um, and I think this is probably a situation in Melbourne as well. Um, uh, the fact that you've all been able to... Um, expand that skill set and to work in an organisation too. So it's not just about playing, but it's also producing and, and programming and a whole range of different things. So perhaps Claire, before, before we go on to some questions, before we just do that, perhaps you could talk about those multiple roles that you're, that you're straddling at the moment. You're, do it, you're, you're a player, but you're also, um, you know, part of the team, part of this delivery team for Melbourne Festival. Yeah, it's been quite um, eye-opening, I have to say. Um, in a really healthy way that I think I'm probably going to spend the next few years, if not longer, um, working through in that it's, it's a really, I was talking to Hadley about this earlier today. It's been such a really strange experience to be, have artist brain um, and be quite an active member of like the Melbourne jazz scene and the Melbourne improvisation scene and know all the people. And then also have this organization programming strategic brain going on over here and understanding there's two sets of agendas and two sets of priorities at all times for different people. Um, and I think as an artist, you don't always, you don't see that. You just don't, you're not thinking about it from another, from an organizational perspective or whatever. And I guess that's been quite conflicting at times for me um, in the programming role, especially um, <clears throat> just because of who I am. And um, so, you know, that's something which I, I think I really want to keep thinking about because it's a unique role to be put in um, to be able to sort of try and bridge that gap between the two, the two people who need to work together to create music and create art for our, you know, our city and in the world. And um, I think the more that everyone can work together, obviously the better the outcomes. So, you know, that's, that's an interesting skill that I didn't even expect I'd, you know, be, be dealing with and, and wanting to build and wanting to think a lot more about how to be both of those things um, in a really effective way so that everyone has a really great outcome. Um, and then in terms of sort of the, the Take Note program, for me, that felt like a really natural extension of all the work I'd already done. I already had quite a, um, you know, having been sort of the, um, the guinea pig for the first version, you know, I could see all of the things that could be improved as well as all the things that worked really well from, from the ground. So um, it put me in just a really easy position to kind of walk into the role and go, oh, okay, well, these are the things that worked really well for the leader and let's keep building on that. But these are, you know, some things we might have not gotten as well the first time or 
um, you know, that sort of thing. And I guess working with Holly has been really wonderful. It's been great to be a, sort of a mentor to her as well and really have a, a close connection and relationship with her because, you know, we were already friends as well prior to her winning um, the, the program. And, um, you know, being able to sort of be that connecting point for her between the festival you know means that there's a safe space for her to sort of express within and, and deal with things that she's dealing with um, in the role as the leader for take note because um, you know the thing I found last year being in that position was it was kind of like someone had said to me we believe in you you know here's here's something for you and um that that was both amazing and incredibly stressful because you you put a lot of pressure on yourself because you want it to be really good and you want the opportunity to to um, you know reach its potential and and all those sorts of things and I I recognise that feeling as well so have really wanted to um, support her through that I guess. Oh, so that's interesting. So the pressure. I wasn't um, I wasn't thinking you were going to go down that track. I was thinking, oh, I can bu- I jump in here and say, yeah, and it's an amazing skill to have this programming skill because it's probably going to bring in more money than you're playing. Or, you know, <laughs> it already has. It come, or you can use it to come in and out of you know in and out of focus when you want you know when you want to. And it's um, and there's you know there are many um, really good examples of this. I mean, you've got Peter. You know, Peter's you on my screen, and and we've got Paul Grabowski coming up after this as on on stage and you know he's a, he's a um an excellent example of a um um uh composer performer impresario isn't he so um Absolutely. programmer fantastic um, example yeah so um it's and i think i think i think from looking looking um, you know, as an outsider, well, I'm not really an outsider, but an outsider looking in, I think this is a really um, key thing about Australia, actually, the fact that you are, because it's a small um, population, you are able to, um, well, actually, sometimes it's from necessity that you need to have wear many hats, but actually it holds you in good stead as an artist, because it means that you're very resilient, you've got a lot of different skills, you can turn your hand at a lot of things, you know, the whole portfolio career that everyone's so obsessed with these days. Can I can I ask a quick, quick sorry Reuben no. can I can I ask a quick question, just throwing it out to Reuben Claire and Aviva, um, like what how do you how have these programs changed um, your conception or your vision for your own for your careers and do you feel like it's shifted? Can I jump in there? Yeah, because um, the point I was going to say, which actually goes to your question as well, um, I think that that experience Claire was talking about of having to, you know, work in different roles, wear different hats, um, see all the perspectives that are in any, any room at any given time and try and find a way to navigate and deal with your own sort of side of it. I feel like that having to deal with that in these programs and these roles has been an incredibly nourishing thing for my artistic practice as well. There's nothing better than having a chance to develop amazing work that is not something that is yours, so to speak. So I think that's a really powerful thing because it gives you a different perspective on where you could place your work, how you could develop it further, but also what, what elements are happening at any point, because it's so hard as an artist, especially when you're really trying hard to develop things and you're really passionate about it. It's very hard to sort of get out of that sort of scope of, what the thing is and i feel like um these programs um allow perspective from all levels um to to seep into your brain so that would be my my contribution to that question and aviva um, you? yeah i was just gonna say i totally agree with everything ruben was saying like i think it's really great to have this opportunity to realize that there are different ways you can enjoy being engaged in in the arts and it doesn't have to be through you necessarily playing your instrument it could be you know, through all these curatorial roles or conceiving of programs or you know, everything that we've all been doing. But I think one of the main things that I learned from being involved in the program and kind of um, tagging along with Peter for a year um, and, and alongside Jerry and everyone as well was that um, there isn't really, like basically what we do as improvising musicians and, and self-producers, it's like it doesn't really totally shift. It's not like you just like, have access to the resources that the art orchestra has and then it's just kind of like easy and everything just happens it's like um which i think sometimes we can think um as individual artists because it feels like we're doing it so tough and the organizations have it 
it's easy. But mm. then when you sort of, um, you know, attend these meetings and you realize like the complications of like, you know, um, negotiating with venues and festivals and trying to pin down some international festival and, you know, how kind of precarious that whole situation still is, even for a really big organization um, or what seems like a big organization to us, it's, um, it's actually quite eye opening because it, it's sort of, in a way, I think it's quite reassuring to realize because it's like, it's just a continuation of what we already learn to do mm. of like kind of constantly, you know, improvising with the opportunities and that arise and like what we have access to and to realize that organizations are still just kind of doing that dance, um, just like maybe on a different level is kind of quite great. I think, because it just means you just get better and better at like learning those skills and figuring out how to do it. But it's actually kind of nice to know that this keeps going like that. That's, a, that, that's an interesting perspective. Yeah. Yeah, it is an interesting yeah. perspective. It's hey, nice to know. I think your mic is scratching on your zip. Is anyone oh, else hearing sorry. that? Yep. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. wasn't sure if it was me. Yeah, I think it definitely is me. I think I've been trying not to turn the heater when on, you're so I'm just... still wearing my upper <laughs> jacket. Puffer. Yeah, but that's a really, really interesting perspective. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is an interesting perspective. So we, we're finishing at half past. At half past, are we? Hadley? Okay. So we've got um, uh, we've got uh, one question mm -hmm. so far that we had in advance, and we might have some more. Claire will let me know if we do. But anyway, the first one we've got um, is um, uh, how an improvising music musician can best represent themselves on a CV. So besides performance and um, besides performance, what other skills or attributes are most important to portray if one is struggling to condense the material? Who would like to take that? Claire would. Excellent. Go, well, Claire. I just have one thought on that. Um, mm -hmm. That is, I had this conversation with a really good friend and mentor, um, probably, I don't know, leading up to, before t tomorrow's my turn I think it would have been and I was applying for something and I had to do a bio and they're the worst mm. <laughs> they're very difficult to write it's hard mm. writing about yourself um and as someone who um as I said before who is really interested in a lot of different things um it can I feel like you can feel like that gets watered down a little bit when you're trying to present that to people because they just kind of go oh you're a bit of that but a bit of that but like what's your specialty or um, or you can get pigeonholed really quickly and really easily and feel like there are lots of things you could do just as capably as someone else or that you're really um, passionate about, but the opportunity doesn't really come your way because people don't have that perception of you. And so having this conversation with my friend about how do I, how do I even do this? You know, and he just said to me, you know, tell your story, your, your bio or your CV um, is your opportunity to write the narrative. So who, who do you want to be kind of um, was his perspective on it. And I hadn't really thought of it in that perspective, I suppose, like um, even, even just putting the word narrative on it was, was pretty um, interesting. I never, yeah, I never thought of it that way. And it, it has helped me um, feel more comfortable and more confident to display the various different things that I'm interested in and not feel like it's anything's being, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Like, Left uh, sorry, Left off. Yeah. Or even, um, watered down or, so, or something. I don't know. Yeah. Mm. I think that that was a really good bit of, bit of advice. Whoever gave you that advice, you know, they sh they, you should be giving them, buying them a beer or something. That was, uh, <laughs> that was very good advice. I think for, uh, um, uh, um, a C or a, well, particularly for a biog. I mean, the narrative around a biog is really important. And I think that the other, the point there is too that if you get that right, um, or almost right, because I think it's a constant adjustment. You know, for because you need to use that biography in so many di different situations. So you're constantly shifting it around and changing the emphasis for whatever the situation is. But if you can get out of the whole idea of just listing names of people that you've played with and um, making it more about you and your sound and what you're about and what your ambitions are and who's, who your work appeals to is, is very good advice, um, particularly at a, at, a, at a younger, you know, at an emerging stage rather than having something that's the same as, um, you know, where you've been educated. I, I mean, I see this all the time, where I've been educated, where you've been educated, what instrument you play and who you've, who you've been on the stage with. 
you know, and the thing yeah. is, it doesn't really, it doesn't really, all it does is set a scene. It doesn't really tell us anything particular about you and yeah, what the th your thing is. The thing is, from my perspective, I, I think, I think, I, I, I mean, I totally agree with with you guys. And um, but you know, um, being an artist and making art is about pushing into the unknown. It's about uncertainty. And writing a bio or grant application is about trying to um, project some kind of certainty. So you have to hold these two contradictory things at once. And when you're writing a bio or a CV, you don't worry about leaving something out as much as you worry about putting a clear picture into the reader's head. And it's the same with a grant application. You have to put a clear picture into that person's head. And some things will be left out. Some things may be overemphasised, like Martel said, you'll adjust it depending on uh, the context. But if you just keep that in mind, that the most important thing is to put a clear picture into the reader's head, then I think that you, you'll get closer and you'll sound more convincing and you'll actually get closer to um, who you are as an artist. And, and, it's, and it's also, it is a great opportunity to practice inventing yourself as an artist and saying clearly, I am this person, this is what I stand for. This is how my art intersects with the culture I, I operate in. Yeah, Can I just add we, to and, that? Oh, yep. sorry. No, go, I go. just was going to say, just in relation to that quick question specifically as writing a CV uh, for an improvising musician, um, I think that's the, the part that we haven't quite addressed because I think it is mm. a little bit different than um, writing a CV if you were a composer or something, for example, because I think improvisers do tend to play with a lot of different people. So um, this kind of idea of just like writing a list of all the people that you've played with is perhaps not so interesting because like... Sure, you might have played with like Miles Davis, sure, but like it's like where in what context or like you know, um, were you all drunk and there were 50 people there? So it's kind of, I think maybe if it, um, if you kind of put it more in the context of like I worked on this project with these people, then you're at once talking about like what that project is and why it was interesting, as well as the people that you were collaborating with. Um, mm. That's great, great advice, Ruben. I'd also just quickly say that um, I think we, we spend a lot of time talking about um, figuring out what the question is for, say, a grant application and looking at the criteria for a grant application. And I do feel like CVs and bios have a similar function. You need to figure out exactly who you're talking to and who you're trying to uh, portray your story to because um, there's not just thing, no such thing as one bio that fits for every context. It has to be constantly moving and shifting depending on where it's uh, being read and what's, uh, what the context is. I've got so many saved versions of bios and CVs <laughs> on my computer. It's outrageous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah, and I do too. So, you know, it never goes away. This, mm. um, this need to re, um, you know, to have a, to rework your um, um, biography. I also, um, I've seen some really nice ones in over the years and sometimes people will um, commission a professional writer to write something about them. And that's always a nice thing too, you know, because you get a diff completely different perspective, different language that might not be your own. Um, and other people see different things in you too. So, you know, that's also an opportunity, not necessarily for a CV, but certainly for a, um, uh, a biography. Mm -hmm. And I can see we've got another, um, uh, we've got an, uh, a Sorry. question from- Sorry, Martel, I feel like I've just, um... No, no, not at all. In, not in at our all. little chat window. But um, before we move on to the question, though, someone did make a comment saying, I think it can help to ask someone. Oh, good. Martel just said it. Good. I just want to make sure. <laughs> all okay. done. We did it. No problem. We did it. We did it. Um, We're done. Okay. So we've got another question here. Um, any tips? No, no. This is from you to me, Claire. We don't need that one. Do yes, we? this is okay. one of the questions. Yep. Oh, it is one of the questions. Any tips questions. on connect? Any tips on connecting to and involving wider audiences within progressive music and arts events? Um, um, and then the, the rest of it is speaking of contradictions, how do each of you navigate time and energy spent between practice and practicals as improvisers and producers? Um, okay, so we've got audiences and we've got time and energy spent. Who wants to take the audiences? Hadley, do you want to take the audiences? Sure. Uh, yeah, sure. I think it really depends on, on the context, I guess, of the work. Um, and then I think if you're trying to look at, I suppose, let's say audience development, 
where you it's worth taking a step back and and I think thinking of where that work best sits um, to possibly access a broader audience, um, whether that's a festival context, whether that's a collaboration. Um, and I think, you know, I think of Viva, you've done some stuff with Chunky Move, and I don't know whether that provides, you know, an interesting new audience, you know, or whatever it might be. Um, and I think I know, you know, probably biased, but I do think festivals provide um, good opportunities for audience development and accessing wider audiences as well, because it, draws from so many. Um, and then I think it's about framing, framing it in whatever delivery context best suits it, or you think best serves that development of an audience. Yeah, creating a, con creating a context for the work, I think is really important. You know, it's yeah. not just about the work itself. It's about what you put around it. It's about creating a space for it to feel special, even before it begins. So that can be, you know, the setting that can be the way it's marketed, that can be some kind of, um, you know, conceptual kind of uh, um, framework for, for it. But some kind of context is is um, often very important, especially in terms of bringing the work to um, new audience. You know, you'll always get, you know, the people who are interested in your work and maybe that's enough for some things, you know, that's, it's, it, you know, but if, 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 if you are actually trying to build a, a new audience for something, then I think context is very important. I think so too. Um, and now we've got a, the other rest of that question is about um, the dual nature of a portfolio career and about time spent. Um, we've got, we've got three minutes according to my clock before we need to stop. So um, uh, does anyone want to tackle this, this question about how much time they spend between um, practicing and um, organizing or the administration work around, around your career? Um, I'm, my, my quick advice is just work nights. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, yeah, it just, I'll, it's time, it just, yeah, it takes time. It's, it's time consuming, <laughs> it's hard work and, um, um, yeah, you just do it. And balance, do. balance is hard. Balance is, balance is, is really hard. hard. And you know, you, yeah, it's just, I like Ruben, I like Ruben's point earlier though, that one feeds the other. So actually you become a, um, a more rounded and more experienced and all of that feeds into the administration, feeds into the practice and the practice feeds into the administration. Mm. And I would just quickly add to that too. Um, one big eye opener for me when I started this program was sitting down at the weekly work in progress meeting and realizing just how much stuff was flying through the air at any given time and watching, watching an organization and a group of individuals dealing with millions upon millions of ever moving constant things that are all those things combined, but then just systematically chipping away at it and not feeling too um, dreaded or too hung up on one particular thing and just noticing that it's all happening at any time and you need to just sort of just keep being pragmatic and keep being methodical and know that there's always going to be more the next day so just sort of get through it <laughs> basically oh yeah we always know there's more the next day <laughs> one final question um someone wanting to work and expand their practice to move into cross art form work they want to know if there's any advice um uh, for people approaching theatre makers or visual artists. Aviva, would you like to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, sure, I would. Um, I guess make sure you're seeing a lot of work, make sure you're seeing work across art forms and that you know who's doing stuff and who's out there and um, who's making work that you love um, because they're the people you should be trying to approach um, and I think if you get really familiar with what they're doing then um, in your approach and that they also know about what you're doing then sort of approaching them about um, a collaboration is you know maybe not such a distant reality um, I think for musicians as well it could be worth considering just time frames for different art forms can vary like very dramatically from mm. music so I think in as musicians we tend to really want things to happen very immediately and sort of one of the great things about our art form is that that can happen um, whereas when you're working with theatre or dance or insta installation work um, a lot of these things are like much longer processes so you might be working mm. on a project over two to three years um, so just to kind of keep that in mind and, and yeah I guess it's just a bit of a change of mindset. 
Great. Thanks. So we just need to finish up. So um, first off, I'll thank everyone. So Aviva, Claire, Ruben, Peter Hadley, thanks very much. Thanks thank to the technical team at the, um, at the festival and to um, the festival itself and to the Art Orchestra for organising this. Thanks to the audience for joining us and thanks for their questions. And um, encourage everyone to stick around now for the solo concert from uh, the incomparable Paul Grabowski, the founder of the Australian Art Orchestra. Mm. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Martel. Thank you, Martel. Thanks. And everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Hadley. Thank you.